Um, I, I would ask a question of you. I want you to think and identify your biggest fear about science. And I want to tell you one of mine. This was, uh, happened about 10 years ago, and I'll give you a little bit of context through my story here tonight of why it was a big issue. Is What I had found is that as I was listening to the publications come out, listening to the press releases about the latest scientific discoveries, I found that I was just always uneasy. There was just this sense of fear or dread about it. And I, and I, was having, and I finally had a chance to think about it and understand it. And, and what I finally realized is that I was actually afraid or fearful that maybe this was the discovery that showed that the Bible wasn't true. Now, what I want to share to you today is my story of how I came to be a growing, practicing Christian and a growing, strong, scient accomplished scientist as well, and how those two really do work together. Because this is what I have found, and, and a truth that has impacted me deeply, is that if God is the creator of the world, and if God is the inspiration for Scripture, then we properly understand his creation and his Scriptures, they're going to agree. And anything we can do to better understand those is going to help us know him better and worship him more properly. Let me say that again. Anything we can do that helps us understand his Scriptures better and understand his creation better, his two revelations, will help us to know him better and to worship him properly. Now, what I'm going to do over the, over the next hour, 45 minutes or so, is to give you a little bit of my story. Uh, there's just certain things you need to know about me for anything else that I'm going to say afterwards to make any sense. And then I want to kind of address a couple of questions or fears or concerns that I have run into that I've had to wrestle with and come to answers, come, come up with good answers to, in order to really see that science is a great ally or a great tool that God has given us to help us understand and know him better. Now, before I get started on that, I've got I've to ask a question of you. Does anybody, has anybody here realized that that light blinks and then three seconds later that light blinks? And if you watch, that light blinks and then that light blinks three seconds later, but that light blinks and then those two lights blink. Did anybody even think to consider that that might be going on? Okay, we got some. Does anybody think, why would somebody possibly pay attention to notice stuff like that? Be honest, I'm not going to be offended, so, okay, all right. Did anybody think, wow, I'm glad somebody's thinking of things like that? All right, okay, that's good, good. The reason why I bring that up is that from my earliest memories, I have been interested in why do things work the way they do. One of, one of my earliest two memories that I want to share, I'm going to give you about uh, four different stories from my life that kind of illustrate how I got from the earliest times I can remember to where I am now a practicing science and I work for a ministry that seeks to spread the gospel by using science apologetics to show that God, the God of the Bible is the author of creation. And one of those first two stories, and I've heard that you, you can't really remember anything, or at least the vast majority of people have no clue or cannot remember anything that happened before they were three years old. Well, I've got two memories from when I was three years old that show or that, that illustrate a point. One is that um, when I was three years old, my dad had just recently graduated with a PhD in, in physical chemistry from the University of Missouri, Rolla in Missouri. And he had moved up to St. Joseph, Missouri to teach at a school up there. And we'd moved into this duplex. And the duplex had a top floor and a basement. The basement generally had a, you know, a garage and a little other room in it. And I remember sitting at the top of the stairs, watching my dad and a colleague of his do a chemistry demonstration or a science demonstration for a group that my older brother was involved with. 
And this demonstration, I, I got to say, I don't remember a whole lot about it, but I've seen it so many times since then that I could, that I, I, I could give it in my sleep most of the time. And this is, he'd do things like he'd take a, a, a rubber ball, a tennis ball, or a, a racket ball, and he'd dip it in liquid nitrogen and throw it on the wall, and it would shatter, and he would blow things up, and he'd make things turn funny colors and make smells and take a banana and pound nails in with it, just stuff like that. I, like I said, I have seen these demonstrations, and have performed many of these demonstrations with myself or myself over the over the years and it just reminds me that just from my, one of the earliest possible times that I can remember I have been interested in how do things work the the finding out why the lights blink the way they do is just a continuation of what I have been doing from the earliest times I can remember a couple of months after that that uh, one of those other early childhood memories was seeing my parents baptized in the 102 River just right outside St. Joseph. Um, they had, when they had moved to this school, my dad and uh, my mom had interacted with a colleague of my dad's and his wife at the school that he taught at, and they had shared the gospel with them, and they had embraced the gospel and realized that Jesus had paid for their sins, um, and they had uh, become Christians and were actively growing and interested, and part of that was uh, in obedience going out and being baptized. And so we gathered out at the river one night. It was, uh, you know, a summer night. Uh, nice Midwest weather in the middle of the summer. It wasn't too hot. It wasn't too cold. Uh, you know, it was just kind of this nondescript river in a lot of ways. If you grew up in the Midwest, I don't know what the rivers are like up here in Canada. I haven't seen them enough to, to, to know. But, uh, you know, just one of these, you know, had a little bit of sandbar, a little bit of rocks and uh, logs and trees growing over. And I remember watching them be baptized. And so, for, again, the, from the earliest moments of my life that I can remember, there's been this interest in science and a very vivid picture of Christianity being very important to how we lived. And as that played out, um, my mom and dad's newfound Christianity, although they grew up going to church, their newfound faith in Christ as their Savior dramatically impacted the way they raised my brothers and I. Um, we regularly went to church after that. I remember, uh, you know, there just wasn't an option of do you go to church. Uh, you know, it was just we went to church. That was part of serving and knowing God. We uh, would take family vacations together so that we build those relationships. It just became very clear to me just how much my parents and, and specifically my dad loved me. I mean, I'm, I'm not, not negating what my mom did, but very vividly remember seeing just how much my dad cared for me. Um, part of the ways that played out was uh, I, my brothers and I played soccer, and I, I remember repeatedly my dad would, uh, even though a, a busy college professor would take time out of his schedule to coach my son or my soccer team or my brother's uh, athletic teams because he wanted to make sure that we were taken care of and we were taught good principles and taught how to play sports and be active. He took time away from his busy schedule to invest in myself and my brothers. And one of the places that played out very vividly for me was when I was a senior in high school. Uh, my parents regularly attended our football games and, and, and the other games that we played, again, just as a measure of investing and showing the value that we had as children to our parents. And during my senior year, my dad's a chemistry professor, and he had won an award for Teacher of the Year. And lo and behold, the award ceremony for this uh, accomplishment was on Friday night, the same time as my football games. And there was this conflict between a schedule where he was going to receive his award and where he was going to go to our football game. And I had found out through my mom that my dad was going to miss the award ceremony for his award to attend one of the run-of-the-mill run football games that I was playing in. And I was very grateful uh, for my mom for letting me know about this because I was able to go up and talk to my dad and say, Dad, I really appreciate what you're doing, but please go to your award ceremony. But the message was loud and clear. My parents loved me. My parents cared about me. My parents valued me more than themselves. Part of their value and concern is, that, again, that they, they repeatedly and, and continually and regularly invested in helping us grow as Christians. 
Um, I was involved with Young Life for a number of years through high school. I uh, would go to their ski trips, and I gotta be honest, I went on the ski trips because I wanted to go skiing. But you also get to hear some very good messages. And I remember coming back from those ski trips or towards the end of the ski trips, there's just an opportunity to recommit your life to devotion to God. And I remember almost every one of those trips doing that and saying, yes, I wanna grow. I wanna know God more. I want to deepen my relationship with him. One of the ways that played out was after my senior year of high school, I had an opportunity to go on a summer mission trip. Now, the summer mission trip was over to Europe. And, and again, I will be frank and honest. I thought, hey, I'd like to go see Europe. But um, this organization was a ministry to teenagers. You had to be between 13 and 19 to go on this. And what this trip was about was encouraging teenagers to deepen their relationship with God. So yes, we got to go over and see Europe and see a number of places in Europe. But before that, we spent two weeks up in northern Minnesota or up in Minnesota um, developing the habits that would deepen our relationship. So there was regular time. We had to get up and clean up our packs every morning, get things packed up, put them out. So there was just a discipline of cleanliness and order and structure that we put into our lives. Part of that daily discipline was spending an hour in God's word, reading what he had to say and learning how to pray and to uh, confess our sins and to uh, intercede for others and how to adore God and worship him and how to read scripture and listen to what God is saying to you. And this is very formative in my life because through that summer, I developed a regular habit of spending time in God's word and praying and fellowshipping with him. And that continued for many, many years afterwards. And so, but this is, this is the time in my life where um, though I'd been to Awana and trusted Christ to pay for my sins, I'd re, you know, committed to wanting to know God more. This is where the rubber met the road and where I began to really begin to pursue and ask that question, what does God want me to do? How do, how do I interact with God? This wasn't just my, my parents' faith anymore. Now it was my faith. It was my desire to grow in my relationship with God. And in the midst of all of that, um, it finally began to occur to me as I was going to college. I went to college. I, got a, I was, going to, or I was uh, attending Iowa State University, pursuing a degree in physics. And uh, during my uh, either sophomore or junior year, they had a fellow from Reasons to Believe came and spoke, and he was talking about how, just how science and faith work together. And there were some issues I was having, and I kind of was able to talk with this fellow for a bit. Uh, but as a career thing, it, began, it got me thinking now, okay, maybe this is what God wants me to do. When I was on these mission, this mission trip, I ran across a number of people who said, yeah, th- I know where God wants me to take me. I know what God's doing in my life. And though I had this general sense, I didn't really know, what does God have for me? And so as I began to see, I was like, hey, this is a career of being able to not only do science, but also to worship and serve God professionally as well. And so I got excited about that. And so I began to pursue that sort of career. And there came a summer, or or came a critical point in right after my first year of graduate school, where this kind of came to a head, and I was, at, or I was sitting there struggling. I was kind of, in some sense, running away from God, but also saying, all right, I don't know where you want me, God. I was ready to give up going to graduate school, uh, kind of afraid that I might not make it through. Just kind of a little bit of crisis of what's going on here. And so I spent some time praying. I'm saying, I, I had this exam that I had to pass, and, and I sat down, and I, I just very remember praying, God, if this is the path you're, you want me on, I would pray that you would help me to pass this exam. But to ensure that I don't get a big head about it and think more about myself, make sure that I am the last person to pass the exam, that I have the lowest score. Now, this exam is given every year, and you have two times to pass it. And as a general rule, 50% of the people pass the test. This year, the year that I was taking it, 40 people were taking the test. So on average, 20 people ought ought to pass the test. And so we took the test. It's this two-day test. It's about a four-hour test each day over all sorts of different physics stuff designed to see, to push you to the place where you don't know things. And so I went and took the test, and I I just kind of didn't know what to think about it, felt kind of uneasy about it. 
the semester started and uh, you know, was in my classes and teaching and I was in a lab and the lab got done about six o'clock each day and so here I am in the lab and it's about 5.30 and my major professor comes up, knocks on the door, opens the door and says, Jeff, can I, come can I talk to you for a second? The first thing I think, okay, what did I do? How am I in trouble here? That's just how I think. But I come out into the hallway and he goes, we have the results back. And so he showed me a plot. There's two different tests, and there's a scatter plot on it. And he showed, okay, so there, you know, depending on how you did, and so there's this cluster of people here, and there's this cluster of people here, and here's the dividing line of the people who pass. Everything below doesn't pass. Everything above passes. And he points out my score. 13 people passed that year. I was number 13. Got it. Okay. I know where I'm going. <laughs> But it just confirmed to me, okay, yes, this is the path that God wants. He wants me to continue to pursue my work in graduate career um, and ultimately to pursue this career in learning how to use science as a tool to evangelize and tell people about God. The reason why, one of the reasons why I wanted to tell you this story is that um, there's this question or narrative out there that somehow science and Christianity just don't mix. That either Christianity is the only way to learn things or, or as it comes from the scientist often, that science is slowly moving God out of the picture, making him irrelevant or even unnecessary or, or, or actively antagonistic towards, science, or towards Christianity. What I have found in my personal life is that if that were true, I do not know how to reconcile how God is calling me to a career in science as I'm growing deeper in him. As I am pursuing him and asking him, what do I do? He's saying, Jeff, I want you to be a scientist. So somehow these two have got to work together. And so as I was thinking and preparing and trying to figure out what is it that I could bring and share, um, how do I address this question, is science making God irrelevant? It seems to me there's two or three issues, or three questions that come up. One is, is science inherently antagonistic towards God? Now, just from a personal experience, I could say, given how God has been working in my life, I don't see how they can be antagonistic. If science was antagonistic towards God, why would God be calling me into a science career? But I think the answer is more profound than that, because when you ask the question, what do you need to do to do science, there are a number of criteria that have to be met. One, you've got to see there's got to be regularity, order, and patterns. That's what a good scientist does, is finds those order, those regularity, and those patterns. But I want to tell you a story that happened when I was a freshman in college. So I'd gotten to Iowa State. I had uh, won an award for, to be able to do some research. And so through the course of the year, I'd been able to do some research in one of the physics labs while I was taking my classes. And the last colloquium of the year, they actually award, or formally presented the award. Uh, you know, there was a little bit of money that went with it. There was some recognition. And the fellow who gave the colloquium talk was a fellow named Willie Fowler. Now, I'm willing to bet that most people have no clue who Willie Fowler is. But for context, this fellow, and, and I did not know this at the time, this fellow was one of the big names in determining how we have all the elements in the universe. How did that actually work? How, do we, how did the universe work? And so I'm sitting there as a growing scientist. Part of what drew me to being a physicist is that there was a precision about physics. If I take a ball and I throw the ball and I know how fast I throw the ball and the angle at which I throw the ball and I can neglect the air in here, I can actually tell you exactly where that ball is going to land and it will do it the same way every single time. There's an order and a precision and a regularity about physics especially that just fascinated me. And so this fellow was giving this talk and he was talking about dating how old the universe was. Now, in the, 1980s, or in the late, or, or, or late 80s when I was going to school, the age of the universe was 20 billion years old. That was the best measurements of the age of the universe. 
And so this guy came in and he was talking about how you could date the age of the universe by, by measuring certain elements because there are certain elements that are formed in stars and then they decay away. And so by measuring the elemental abundances, you could get an age of the universe. And he was sitting through and going through all that and he got an age of the universe of 10 billion years. And he goes, that's within a factor of two, that's good enough for me. I thought, that's kind of arrogant. The universe is 20 billion years old. You got 10 billion years. That's just wrong, right? What I began to appreciate, though, as I continued through my scientific career, is that yes, there is a precision, that there is a mathematical precision behind how this universe works, but there's a complexity about how this universe works that makes it difficult to apply it all the time. And so very often, we have a limited knowledge about things. And so we have, sometimes we just realize, we've got to realize there's, a, there's a, an, a limit to how much we know. And sometimes being within a factor of two is, is very good. Now, in the 1980s, that was permissible. Now we know the universe is 13.8 billion years old. If we, somebody came in and said it was 10 billion years or 20 billion years, they'd get left off the stage because the measurements no longer allow that much flop in, in the age. You know, there's, there is a much greater precision. But what his statements began to help me realize is that there is, again, a deep fundamental order and structure and regularity in nature that we can go look and make measurements of what happened today and what's going to happen yesterday, and we're going to get the same things over and over and over as long as we do the same kind of measurements every time. Not only that, that as humans, our minds work in a way that we can look at the data that we get draw inferences about what's going on, and those inferences we have reason to trust that are good. And so that's, we can actually build models, or I can build other models and then go off and do other experiments that would help me confirm or deny which of those models would work well. Now, in order to do all of that, there's got to be order in the universe. There's got to be regularity. The universe needs to be good. It can't just be something that we're supposed to avoid or transcend in some way. The universe needs to not be divine, because if the universe is divine, we don't go study it that way, we worship it. The universe, that not only does it need to be orderly and regular, but it's got to be within our comprehension to be able to do science. It could be that it's order and regular, but it's just it's so far beyond what we could comprehend that we can't do science. And so there's, there's a whole list of criteria, you could maybe delineate about 10 of them, uh, that in order for the scientific enterprise to work, need to be true. Order, regular, consistent, uh, day in and day out. We can make inferences. We've got that uh, moral character is important. You can't lie about your results, you know, I mean, all sorts of things. And then when you ask the question, what worldview or what way of looking at the world gives good reason to believe those things are true? It's not Buddhism, because there you're trying to transcend the world. You don't want to study the world. It's not atheism, because in atheism there's no reason to trust all the accidents that led to our mind. It's not Hinduism or, or, base, or base religions, those that worship nature, because you don't, if you're worshiping nature, you're not going to study it. The only one that anchors all of those things necessary for science is Christianity. And it's no surprise then that the scientific enterprise actually took off and flourished in a Judeo-Christian society. Western Europe. That's where it took off and flourished. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying you have to be a Christian to do good science. But what I am saying is that when you're doing good science, you're thinking like a Christian. Because the, the worldview that anchors all the stuff you need to be true in order to do science is Christianity. And so the question, is science inherently antagonistic towards God? Absolutely not. The only way we can do science is if the God of the Bible is indeed God. He actually exists and he's, and he's how he's revealed himself through scripture. That's the only way we can do science. So science is not inherently antagonistic towards God. In fact, it's a way to study the revelation that God has given through his creation. 
So maybe if he's not, in, maybe if science isn't antagonistic, maybe science actually will find things that show that the Bible is not correct. And that was one of my deep concerns. I find I was so grateful to have realized that because it gave me an opportunity to think, why do I think that way? And as I have studied over the years, um, I, I cannot ever say that I've had one of these big times where I'm saying, okay, is it God or is it the, uh, science and do I have to choose? I've had a number of things. I'm like, how do these work together? One of those big ones is as I came back from the summer mission trip when I was a senior in high, or after my senior year of high school, going to college, uh, I'm beginning to read my scriptures a lot more voraciously and I start reading through Genesis. And I had a, a study Bible that had little notes um, that... At the time, I tended to put almost as much credence in the notes as I did the words of Scripture itself. And when you read those notes in the Bible that I had, it said, these have got to be 24-hour days and, and the universe is 10,000 years old. I'm like, okay, if that's what the Bible says, I'm there. I believe what the Scripture has to say. But the problem I have is that you look out at the universe and it really does look to be billions of years old and the earth it looks to be billions of years old. So I've got the Bible saying one thing and the science saying something else. How do I reconcile those? And I gotta say, I came up with a couple of models. I'm figuring, okay, if that's really what the Bible says, eventually scientists are gonna get it. Maybe time is logarithmic. And so, you know, what gets marked out as a day is actually, you know, there's these differences, kind of depends on your frame of reference type things. When Hugh Ross, uh, the founder of Reasons to Believe, came and spoke at Iowa State, I addressed that question to him. So this is something I've been struggling with. And one of the things he looked at me and said, you know, he said, when you look at how Christians have interpreted Scripture, how they say what, what's going on there in those days, the, that 24-hour day view or calendar day view is one of those interpretations. But when you look at what the group or what Christians who hold a high view of Scripture hold, they say there's other ways to look at that. Those might be longer period, longer days. They might not meant to be 24 hours. They might be analog and, and analogous days where they're 24-hour days, God's work week, but God's days are much longer than our days. And so the point I got was that when I began to study the scripture deeper, I realized that that was one good interpretation, but that there were other interpretations that held a high view of scripture. And so what was this conflict between what I found in God's revelation in scripture and God's revelation in creation upon deeper study, went away. They actually worked well together. And as I began to investigate and say, okay, what does science have to say about this universe? Well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That that's, has that connotation of bringing into existence something new. You read throughout scripture and, and uh, God's reliability and sustaining creation is likened to his capacity or his reliability in keeping his promises to the nation of Israel. So we expect to see that how the universe behaves is going to be constant, or, or there's going to be constant laws of physics. That would be how it manifests itself. And, you know, we talk about the heavens being stretched out, and yet there's this decay. And then we go look and say, all right, what is scientifically, what do we find? Well, we see that over the 20th century, there is this picture emerged of what we know of the universe. We know that the universe began to exist at the Big Bang. We know that the universe is governed by constant laws of physics. We can make very detailed measurements about that. We know that the universe is expanding. We know that the universe is subject to a law of decay. Lo and behold, the way scripture describes creation and the way science describes creation are painting the same picture. That to me was, you know, when I first heard Hugh Ross talk about that, I thought, okay, that's kind of nice. That's a Christian saying that. I wonder what the scientists themselves say. And I go out and I start reading some of the scientific literature. And lo and behold, the scientists are saying, yes, the universe began in the Big Bang. The universe is expanding. The universe is governed by... Con Science indeed was affirming what the Bible talked about the universe. And so that, to me, encouraged me, said, yes, it began to give me a picture that, this, that God has revealed himself in creation, or in scripture, God has revealed himself in creation, and as we properly understand the two, they're going to agree every single time. Now, fast forward about 10 years later, I'm sitting around a dinner table at a, at a local conference that I'd been at, 
Um, earlier in the day, we, there was a, an, an astrobiologist from NASA who had been talking about finding, you know, finding the history of life on Earth. And I, and I remember asking him a question. I go, what would it or how would we ever distinguish scientifically what it would look like, what would be the difference if life had just formed naturalistically as opposed to it being created? How would that differ? And he kind of looked at me and kind of looked askance, and he could tell the question, we, we just weren't quite connecting there. A couple other people in the audience all, you know, talked about, oh, you're just one of those silly creationists, you probably believe all this other... But just kind of ignoring that, I went back and forth, he said do this, and so I kind of clarified my question, and we went back and forth, and he finally... I asked my question clearly enough that he understood it. And he looked at me and he goes, you know, I never really thought about that. So I don't have an answer. I go, that's great. I appreciate the honesty. And so the question kind of went by. Around the dinner table that night, one of my co or a colleague that I was working with at UC Riverside said, you know, your question intrigued me. I've never thought about how do you test whether divine activity might have happened. And so we ended up having this conversation about how you would do science if a, if a god was involved or a supreme deity or whatever, you, what, I forget the term we were using for it. And so we were kind of back, bantering back and forth and I argued that, well, the universe would probably look designed and you might have difference of this. And um, at, at about, we had that discussion going on for five, 10 minutes. And I said, uh, you know, well, you got a beginning of the universe and the universe looks designed. And he looks right at me and he goes, yes, but which universe? And I go, what? He goes, well, yeah, the, we're, our theories are saying that we're, we're just one universe amongst a whole bunch of them. And so here science is advancing again, seeming to say that my nice little tidy arguments about why God exists and the Bible fits, how do I deal with this multiverse? And I can tell you, at the conversation, I'm like, I, uh, I didn't do that, but I was sitting there and I didn't have a good answer. And so I spent and started reading and saying, okay, well, maybe I can just ignore the multiverse. Maybe it'll go away. Well, it turns out that it doesn't work that way. You know, the multiverse keep popping up in, in the scientific literature. And finally, I, I just sat down and I finally just dug in and said, all right, what do I have? What, what's going on here? The Bible talks about how the universe has a beginning and is designed and orderly, and now science is saying there's all these, our, multi, our universe is one amongst a whole bunch that may have existed forever. What do I do with that? I'm not going to give you the final answer. Well, I'll give you the, 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 the bottom line answer without all the details. I'll refer you to the, this little booklet that I wrote called Who's Afraid of the Multiverse? And, and this is not shameless plug for Jeff Zwerink. What it does is it gives you an understanding of what is the multiverse, how do scientists think about it? And how does it impact what Christianity has to say? And the bottom line is that even if the, a multiverse exists, there's still a beginning. And even if the multiverse exists, there's still design. And so whether the multiverse exists or not, I don't know. I'm inclined to think one probably does. But in no way does the existence of a multiverse argue that God doesn't exist. In fact, I think research into the multiverse has actually strengthened the case or the scientific case that God actually exists, that the Bible has it right all along. And so what I have found is that every place I have dug in where it seems like science and Christianity or, or my understanding of the Bible and my understanding of science conflict is I've dug in and gotten to the bottom of it. What I've found is that lo and behold, at the end of the day, they agree. And so, you know, I've talked about Big Bang cosmology and the multiverse. Here, I'll throw another one out there. What if we find life in the universe? Is that going to bother you? In every instance, what I have found as I'm going and looking at this, very often I have inaccurately characterized what the Bible had to say about these things. As I've read through Scripture, I know there's a whole lot that what the Bible says about what God has done here on earth, how he's created humanity, how he's interacted, what Jesus' interaction and life, death, here on, life, death and resurrection here on earth mean. But it says remarkably little, in fact, I argue, maybe nothing about whether he might have created life somewhere else in the universe. And so scientifically speaking, I think looking for life in the universe is a great question. It's an ambitious question. It's one that requires lots of advances, but it also is broke, it can be broken down into tangible goals that we can go about accomplishing. And so it's a very good question. Is there life out there in the universe? And if we find it, does that conflict with Scripture or not? It has always driven me back to ask the question, what is Scripture really saying here? And so my scientific studies have actually 
forced me to have a better understanding of Scripture. And at the end of the day, that's what I have found has allowed those two to always reconcile, is that I'm forced to understand what is Scripture really saying and what is science really saying. Because if they're both revelations from God, at the end of the day, they've got to agree. So I have found in my studies that I have never found anything science knows that actually conflicts with Scripture when they're properly interpreted. And so if science isn't inherently antagonistic towards God, and science has never found anything that disproves uh, God or disproves the Bible, then um, there's one final question that I think often contributes to this seeming tension between science and Christianity, is what happens when we finally, or when we, when we reach, find an explanation for something we always thought God did? Does that, does finding an explanation remove the need for God? Because I can tell you this, we have a pretty good understanding of how our universe began to exist. We have a pretty good understanding of why all the elements exist or why we have the distribution of elements that we have in this universe. We have a pretty good understanding of how many planets form, how stars form, uh, how our moon formed. We have an explanation for a lot of those things. Does that remove the need for God? My answer is no. Let me, give you, let me give you an example why. Grew up in Iowa. I'm sure this is probably one of the few crowds I talk to that will get this, is that um, Iowa gets pretty cold in the winter. And there was a creek. When I walked back and forth to school or to work every day at school, um, I had to cross this creek. And as it got into the March, it had been a particularly cold winter, and the, the creek had frozen solid. And it began to melt and began to melt. But as it had froze, it actually froze into the banks. And so as I'm walking home one day, I'm crossing the bridge, and I look out, and there's water. The the creek is full of water, and it's just as smooth as can be. I mean, it is glass across this creek. But yet you have all of the texture of the ice. And so you see the bumps and the shapes, you see the different colors and the variations. And see, normally the ice floats on top of the water, but because there, for this day, for whatever reason, the, the water was covering the ice. So you saw all the texture of the ice, but you had this smooth glass surface over the top. And I, I actually walked up, sat there, stood on the edge of the creek, and just stood there and looked at it for about 10 minutes. Because I, was, I just found it beautiful. I was just very engaged by this. Now, the reason why I was engaged by that is because I understood why it was so unusual. Normally, when the creek melts, the creek rises and lifts the ice up and the ice floats on top. But this one, because it had been so cold, the ice had frozen and anchored to the, to the bank so that even as the water was creeping up, it had not melted the, the, the edges enough that the ice floated and so the water was able to come up above the ice. And so I'm looking at this situation and my understanding, my explanation of it actually makes it look more, it gives me a greater sense of awe about it. And this is where I think Christians often make an error, subtle error, that they, that they don't, often not aware of. And, and I say that because I've often, I found myself making this error, is that there was this idea that if I've explained it, therefore I don't need God. Well, as again, as I look at what does, how does Scripture talk about God? Scripture talks about God and creation in this way, is that God holds all things together. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit hold all things together. That if God were to remove his hand from creation, creation would simply cease to exist. As a physicist, I tend to think of God as, okay, uh, sitting back there, all right, let's make a universe. Okay, there's the universe. Oh, these are good laws of physics. Let's put those on there. And the universe just kind of runs. But that's not the God that the Scripture describes. Scripture describes a God who is intimately involved. In fact, he upholds and sustains creation so regularly that we can look at how it behaves and say, oh, there are these laws of physics. The laws of physics are a reflection of how reliably God maintains creation. And so if we find an explanation, that doesn't remove God. That just says we found the mechanism by which God works. 
And so let's avoid this temptation to say, we don't understand that's where God's working. No, as we find how God works, that should draw us to a greater worship and appreciation of who he is. And so science is not inherently antagonistic towards God. Now, scientists can be, but science is not. I know numbers of scientists who are antagonistic towards God. But science itself is not antagonistic towards God. Science has not found anything that disproves that God exists or disproves the Bible. It's forced us to go back and re-examine what, we, what, what Scripture says so that we get a deeper understanding. But that's exactly what I would expect to do between God's two revelations. If God's revealed himself in Scripture and God's revealed himself in creation, they ought to force us to make sure that we get the right interpretation. And ultimately, just because we find an explanation of something does not remove the need for God. In fact, finding the explanation really just anchors it, asks the question, why are these excuse me, why are, there these, why are there these laws? Well, again, that's something that in Christianity, those are well anchored. They aren't another world religion or any other worldview. You just kind of have to take them as givens. So science is not antagonistic towards God. Science is not disproving anything of God. Science gives us an explanation, helps us understand how God works. I would actually argue that science is a very powerful tool. One final story, and then we'll wrap up here. But Ten years ago, uh, we, or sorry, a little bit, a little bit more backstory. We, my brothers and my dad and I had established this uh, annual Zwering fishing trip. And so we would go on this fishing trip and it got, it went from let's go out and fish in the, the local, or the local lake to uh, let's go down and get to a bigger lake and rent a bigger boat to let's go fishing out in the Gulf of Mexico. And in this particular instance, this was one of the first forays down to the Gulf of Mexico. And it was a Zwering, Zwering thing. All the Zwering men would do this. And this particular instance, um, my dad had planned this trip about a month before my third child was born. And my wife had been having uh, pregnancy problems with that one. So he had planned this trip in a way that I couldn't go. A and what had happened as a result of that is I had been left out. Here my dad, the person who was supposed to take care of and look, look after me the most, had decided to leave me out of a great Zwerink tradition. And I was angry and upset at him. Um, I knew the trip was coming up in about a month, and in that month, didn't have a whole lot of contact with him, but I knew I had to do something. I'm either going to sever my relationship or kind of become just very... Uh, superficial relationship, or I got to figure out how to do this. And it's getting, you know, two, three, four weeks pass, and it's getting up close to the trip, and I'm sitting here, what do I do about this? And I'm spending time in, in praying and meditating on what, what I should do here. And God brought back to my mind, you're, you're upset at your dad. Why are you upset at your dad? What do you know about your dad? This is the same dad who coached all your teams, right? This is the same dad who would take family vacations, right? This is the same dad who regularly took you to church. This is the same dad who was going to miss his award ceremony to go to your football game. This is the same dad, right? And I was confronted with a truth there. I could either choose to believe the truth that my dad loved me and act that way, or I could choose to let my anger, frustration, whatever else it might have been, get in the way, what I, something that was important to me. When I chose to believe the truth that my dad loved me, nothing changed with my dad, but my bitterness, my anger, my conflict started to dissolve and go away. Application over here. As Christians, God, or we believe that God has revealed himself in creation, God has revealed himself in scripture. Often we run into places where those revelations poke at us in ways we don't like. It's this way, not the way you want it to be. We have a choice. We have a choice where we're going to put our faith. Are we going to choose to believe what we want or are we going to choose to believe the truth? 
Great example out of scripture. John the Baptist, in prison, sent his disciples to Jesus. Are you the one, or should we wait for another? Now, if you think about the question, it's a ludicrous question. This was John the Baptist who recognized Jesus in the womb. This was John the Baptist who grew up with Jesus. John the Baptist who spent his life adult life career preparing for the Messiah. John the Baptist who baptized Jesus when he brought him up, heavens opened, dove came down, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This same John the Baptist, are are you the one? Now, I don't mean to cut John short because he's going to die if he continues down his path. And he's wanting to make sure, am I really doing what's true? Am I believing the truth here? Jesus' response to him was very interesting. It's not, it was not, hey, John, you just got to believe. Jesus' response was, oh, come on, John, you got to know better. Jesus' response was, Jeff Swearing's paraphrase, what does the data say? And he gave him a list of data that the scripture said, this is what the Messiah is. And if Jesus matched that data, then he's the Messiah. Well, we have that, we have that with science as well. Science is a tool to figure out how this creation works. We can choose to put our faith in what is true, or we can choose to believe that they're in conflict with one another. If we choose to believe they're in conflict with one another, we're going to be defensive. And so that's what I want to leave you with tonight. My challenge to you is to think about whatever that fear was. What fear do you have of science? And then ask the question, what is the truth about this? What does God really say about this? And whatever that is, choose to believe that. Because when we do that, when we choose to believe the truth, the truth will set us free. Thank you.